Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I have a really cool guest today. Before we get started, I just want to make a really quick announcement. By the time you all are hearing this, this is probably somewhere around north of episode 80-ish, and uh, I would just want to say thank you for listening. And if you can give me any feedback, good, bad, or ugly, please, you know, head on over to my the website at everyonelovesguitar.com or go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash everyone loves guitar. I just want to know what you like, what you dislike. Don't worry, you won't hurt my feelings. And I just want to know what's going on. That being said, I've got this is a, a landmark episode today because not only do we have a really cool guest who is really smart and talkative and a lot of fun, uh, this is our first woman on the show. I'm really happy. <laughs> That's right. Um, and 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 we're not be. This is not a subtle guest. So we're. <laughs> I'm I'm thrilled to have Beth Garner on the show. Beth is a really good guitarist, great blues guitarist. And let me give you some of her background. In 2006, she released an album called Addictions, which placed number three on the Euro American chart. She then did two tours of England and Wales. She's a Texas native who moved to Tennessee in 2007 and then began a three-month U.S. tour with a Russian band called the Red Elvises, where she played small, sold-out venues from coast to coast. After that tour, she returned to Nashville. She wrote, recorded, and released Twister Warning by the Tennessee Twisters, which was placed in the indie film Voices Thrown Silent, and her song Jaded Heart of Gold was also placed in an indie film called The Bounce Back. This year, she released her newest CD called Snake Farm, which released, which sorry, which reached number three in the iTunes blues chart. I've had the pleasure of listening to the album. It's a really cool blues album. It's a lot of fun, and we'll talk more about it on today's call. Beth, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm very honored to be the first woman. That's right. Please be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. Hey, hey uh, I, I didn't. I wanted to ask you a question before we get started about the um the the sync work you did with with the independent movies yes did you like doing that um yeah of course um yeah that somebody wants to put your song in a uh their movie yes by all means do it they were very in, independent films but you know i was honored very cool yeah I, I i've interviewed a lot of people who do sync and a lot of other guys and i think that's one of the one of the not so gut, you know, uh, heart wrenching or gut wrenchingly competitive aspects of music. It's very hard to get into and, and maintain it, but I know a lot of guys that are, you know, pursuing that. That's why I asked. Yeah, for sure. Me too, Klaus. Yeah, Luke. right, yeah. right. Klaus. Just, yeah, he's, he's, he's the he's, king right now. So, yeah, him and Shay. I'm interviewing Shay, I think, next week. They do a lot. <laughs> That's good. But the amount yeah. of work they put out is unreal. I know Klaus is he's the king right now so kudos to him I remember when he first got to town oh, now right. get him <laughs> All righty so let's talk about Snake Farm I I really did genuinely enjoy the album it's a great blues album it's it's Thank very you. diverse you got straight ahead blues you got swamp boogie sly guitar you got some you know heavy tremolo on one of the songs and then it closes with a cool to me which was was like an anthem a blues rock anthem called Wish I Was so my first question is, what prompted you to create the album in the first place? It's a massive undertaking. Well, um, it had been a little bit while since I'd released any new music, and I knew it was time. You know, if you want to stay in the business, you need to keep putting out content, as they say. Um, I call it doing my art. And I also had a bunch of songs in my head, and um, it was just time to do a blues record. I, I've been here in Nashville for almost – for nine years and um you know i dove into the country scene i got immediately hired by um a gal named shelly bush and she um she had an all-girl country band and i mean like the next weekend i had to learn 110 country songs so it was like wow. quantity and not quality and and then ever since then i've just been getting last minute calls for all these country bands so i had to just really just immerse myself in it, even though I came from a, a 
jazz blues background and the Texas music scene is very, everybody does their own music. And, um, and then you move to Nashville and you do everybody else's music. So I had just immersed myself in this country music scene and I felt like I'd really exhausted, um, my resources where I was and I got very burnt out. So I kind of took my own little hiatus, even if I was still out playing, I took a little mental homebody hiatus. And then I started going to places where I didn't normally go, which was, um, blues clubs again. I just wanted to, I went there to hide and, um, I ended up just, uh, getting back into it again and going, Oh, thank you. Okay. This is what it's, this is what I remember about it, you know, actually feeling it and doing it. So at that point, um, I had met, um, my current business partner, he's a fan and he always liked my music and he believed in me and, and like, well, you know, why don't you do an album? So I was like, okay. And I had a couple songs in my head and I just kind of finished them the night before you go into the studio, you know, how that goes. <laughs> Um, but the criteria was that it had to be blues. It had to be three chords. It had to be heartfelt and soulful. And, um, I wanted my guitar solos back in there and I was going to be consistent with the roots of the blues, but put my own touch on it. Um, because I, I feel like I've paid a lot of dues and, um, I can do, I can do my thing now and still keep my, uh, toe in the, in the bath, you know, of the roots of the blues. So I just, I still did it my way, but, um, that's kind of how it all came out. And I got to take a really long time to do it. You know, we recorded all the rhythm tracks in a couple days, well, but really one day. And then I got to come in and put finishing touches and sit on the mixes for a really long time through Randy Kors, um, from Slack Key Studios. And uh, his ears are amazing, so nothing slipped by him. And, um, you know, so that was kind of the, the foundation of where it started and why I did it was it was just time. And I, I have a I have a saying where if you don't finish a song, a new one will not come in. So I finished all these blues songs to make room for new art. And um, and out came this album that I'm, I'm really proud of it. It's I'm, I'm most proud of this album than I am more proud of this album than I am any of my other things that I've done. Oh, except for some of the Tennessee twister stuff that just was fun. But as far as like the mixing, it's top notch. The mastering is top notch. Uh, the music, excuse me, <laughs> the musicianship is top notch. Um, you know, I, I got some of the world's greatest players and there's no click track it's heartfelt and um that's basically um it as far as that goes <laughs> yeah i think you should be proud of it so it is a, a an excellently produced mastered and engineered i mean it sounds really clean super clean a yeah. couple a couple of things you said well what i wanted to ask you is when when i listen to that to me that sounds like if your genre it sounds like you're a blues guitarist i mean i if you told me well really craig i country is first and foremost i'd be surprised what is, is but what it, is that your natural genre blues i would say it is yes yeah. um i went to a jazz well i went to an arts high school in downtown dallas called booker t washington high school for the performing and visual arts and um they're known for their jazz musicians um you know, Nora Jones went there. Roy Hargrove came from there. Um, uh, Erica Badu. Um, but oh, wow. as I was going there and I was studying jazz, I was really, really, really into the blues. Um, I was listening to Magic Sam and Freddie King and BB King and, you know, all the Kings. And um, I knew that if I did not do the blues first, then I would never ever be able to sound authentic. It's when you hear people that start out as country players, I'm not trying to offend anyone by saying this, but if you don't start out playing the blues, you almost really don't sound like you can play it. it you'll hear country musicians try to play the blues and it, you can tell they didn't start with it. But, yeah. you know, Muddy Waters said, the blues is the roots and music is the fruits and you got to start with the blues. So I did start with the blues, but it was concurrent with jazz. Uh, 
question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. You know, you mentioned Freddie King. I cannot tell you how much that guy has meant to my life. I mean, he, he is, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm almost welling up now just thinking of how much I've listened to him and how, how much I care about his music. It's uh, For sure. Yeah. And his voice. People talk about these blues guitar players, but yeah. their voices, too. Oh, his voice was just amazing and soulful and real. Yeah. Love him. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. You made a comment earlier. You said, I've paid a lot of dues. Can you elaborate or be more specific if you're open to it? If not, that's totally Yeah, clear. I mean, I've, you know, I've... I've done my fair share of, of, um, gigs. I've done my fair share of shit gigs. Um, you know, terrible PA systems, terrible, uh, traveling conditions, um, bad pay, you know, uh, the people around you, um, you know, it's, it's the wild west. (laughs) So, you know, I've walked through the doors of, of, you know, I wouldn't ever say that I had an addic- addiction problem, but, you know, you're drinking at these places and you have to make sure it doesn't bring down your playing and, um, you know, be an adult about things. Um, yeah, I've definitely paid some dues. I'm still paying them. You'll never stop. Do you think, and I, and I don't want to make this like political, but I have, you're the first woman I've interviewed and it's not because I don't like interviewing women or I've said, make sure you don't refer me to any women. I just haven't gotten, there's just not a lot of women artists. You know, the percentage of, of women, female guitarists is small. Professional yeah. female guitarists is small. What is, as a, and I hate to ask this question cause I don't mean it any way other than like for you to share your experiences. What, what, as a woman in a very, very, very heavily male-dominated field, what has been the toughest thing that you have found where you have to do something just to get on level playing ground? Um, people are hypercritical of me because I'm a woman. Even if I can hang, even if I am just as good as somebody around me, I will be able to um, play a four-hour country gig And not only play guitar, but sing background vocals and sing lead. And, you know, I can hang on my solos, but somebody will still come up and be like, eh, they look at those mistakes, even the same mistakes that they make, and they are magnified in their eyes. And um, we're just way more criticized. We're just held to a higher and a lower standard at the same time. We're dismissed much quicker and... um, you know, it's just, it's a boys club. Um, there's a lot of girl guitar players that are coming out that are doing really well. Um, well, I think, um, but, um, you know, mainly it's just the hyper criticism. Um, I, it just makes me work harder. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what is it, what, what coping skills or coping mechanisms have you found that you've had to adapt to, uh, to deal just, to deal with that bullshit basically i just make sure that every time people hear me that i'm better and that i sound better and i sing better and i play better and i'm doing something different and um and even if it's not uh flurries of 30 second notes um highly compressed uh um it still is soulful and you will feel it mm. um you know, just always try to be better. Always, always a work in progress. Always. But I, I don't really, I don't really have too much of the negativity nowadays. I think, um, that my, my peers, they respect me and, you know, we give each other props and, um, you know, so it's, it's not so much nowadays. Um, so I'm thankful for that. <laughs> but m- I guess more so early on when, in other words, the skepticism that any new person would have was probably a little amplified because on top of being new, you're a woman. Yeah. Um, plus they, they, well, you know, sometimes you don't get the gig because you're a woman and they don't want a girl on the tour bus because maybe the wives don't want that. And, um, yeah. you know, there's, there's lots of reasons, but also, um, I mean, we're, it's really, it's just this, the hypercritical part. Yeah. That's the main thing, you know, 
Um, I can hang in any situation if given the chance. Hmm. Um, but sometimes I don't get picked just because they just, they're just not interested. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I take it all with a grain of salt nowadays. Good. Hey, anybody who says anything, just tell them to fuck off and give them a copy of uh, Snake I Farm. I do. Give, uh, give them a copy of Snake Farm and tell them to fuck off. That's yeah. That, well, that's your I, response. I this, you get like, especially when I was younger, and even when I moved to Nashville, um, they're like, you need to move more. You need to smile more. You need to do this. Forget the fact that I just was fresh out of jazz school and blazed their fucking faces off. Mm-hmm. You know, they're looking at me trying to say, oh, you need to smile more, you need to do this more, and blah, 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 blah. And I got to Nashville, it was worse. Everything is pretend. You're like, you pre- you're in this band, they hire you because, oh, you're a girl fiddle player. I'm guilty of that. They hire you because you fill this um, image for their band. And um, and then when I got to Nashville, people were saying, you need to dance more, you need to move more, you need to do this. So I was like, okay, fine. So when you try to move more, your playing is affected. So my playing suffered for a little while and then you fix that. And then you, then your vocals suffer and you're trying to fix your guitar playing. So you fix that. And then, you know, Oh, you fix your image a little more. So, you know, I take dance and, and I work out, you know, so it's always, always, always a work in progress. But, but there are people, you know, just, a couple months ago, somebody told me that I needed to smile more. And the guy standing next to me playing is in his grandpa shoes. And uh, <laughs> I mean, we're equal players and everybody's equal on stage. But he told me to smile more. I got off that stage. I walked right past him and I said, go fuck yourself. I was like, you tell such and such to go smile more? No. And I just walked off. We're still friends. Everybody's still friends. But I sometimes I can't take it. Sure. I'm just like, you go fix yourself. You know, don't be telling me yeah. that in that tone of voice because you're going to get it right back. And it was, and plus, right before I got on stage, I probably wasn't smiling. I got the equivalent of the news that I got right before I went on stage is the equivalent of equivalent of like, oh, your puppy died. Now oh. go, now go play some, play something upbeat. You know, you're like, <laughs> oh god, okay, fine. Yeah, I got so, you. Anyway, you know, I'm um, I'm real, so that's. That's uh, you know, it it doesn't it doesn't bother. It just happened that he caught me at a moment. Yeah, yeah, it was a bad day more than happened to be anything with your smile or your you yeah. know. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. Well, hey, let's talk about let's let's change the gears and talk about sure. some good stuff, which is uh, some of the songs on your album. Uh, All right, by me, Mister Fisher. That sounds like a Beth Garner love song to or about somebody. Is that what that was? Um, actually this song, um, I love how it came together. It was, it was, I was sitting in the living room with my friends from Bugaboo and, what is that? Uh, were, sorry, what is that? Bugaboo was a band in Austin. They, they were oh, okay. pretty successful. Um, they had some good stuff. They're blues rock okay. and, um, they were playing some shows in Nashville. So I let them crash in my house and Chad Pope, the other guitar player is just, he's one of my, he's my brother from another mother. We've known each other for 20 years. And, um, so we're just sitting in the living room and I was like, let's write something. They're like, okay. And I said, say something. So Clayton Colvin was like, silly Willie. And I was like, ha ha, that's funny. He said, that's something my daughter would say. And I was like, okay. So I wrote it down. And then my dog runs up to me. She's got this little crochet monkey in her ha- in her mouth and she's trying to share it. And I was like, go get your crochet monkey. And then I was like, okay, well that sounds like a verse. And then I put it to these chords, blues chords, but I wanted to put a little twist. So I added the flat seven and the flat three. And uh, the first verse, I didn't feel like putting a turnaround on it. So I didn't. And then these verses, I wrote a bunch of silly verses like that. I liked the flow of the words. And then I was like, okay, Mr. Fisher is fictional, you know, but you got me hook, line, and sinker. You know, it's Fisherman, hook, line, and sinker. And I just, oh, it was really yeah. a fun song that I wrote. Gotcha. And um, we recorded it, and it, I, I loved the rhythm of Baby, I Love You by Aretha Franklin. So I was yep. like, I want you to feel good like that. I want to make it feel like that. So we did that in the studio, and then um, I definitely wanted horns. I wanted background vocals, but I wanted it to be loose, and I wanted it to be fun. So everybody contributed to that. We brought, I think, the background vocals make that song to me. They make it. Those ladies sang. It was um, 
Angie Prim and Gail Mays, their sisters, and they are amazing. Um, talk about your background singers being way more talented than your front person. Woo! Man, <laughs> you can sing. Um, but then I wanted the background vocals to not be the same every time. I was like, we're talking, we're having a conversation. So, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Fisher, you got me hook, line, and sing. I mean, so it was really just a, it was a fun thing that unfolded as it went. So, um, my solo in it was all one take. I, I liked that. Oh, wow. Um, make it talk, you know? Um, and I made it simple, you know, it's like, let's say something here. So that song was really like, it was a process and everyone contributed. And, um, I think it feels great. And that's how that song came about. It really, I wanted it to be a jam. I wanted it to be like, okay, so maybe somebody's like in, uh, has a band like the band and this is a jam. Let's, you know, somebody get your tambourine out and get your shaker and, let's jam on this song and take long solos. It's simple and the verses are simple and universal and you can sing them. And, but that's how that song came about. Very cool. So it's Mr. Fisher's and a fisherman. That's what I, I didn't realize that was very cool. So you, there's a <laughs> lot, sorry. And I was just laughing because you said he's a fisherman fart. Go ahead. Uh, there's a lot going on in there. As you said, you got horns, you got backup <laughs> singers, you got a guitar solo. So who, like, what goes into the decision making around that, and who kind of makes those decisions, as far as, and, and is that difficult to manage? I mean, there's a lot of people you've got to sort Not of. Not at all. It was just what I heard. Um, I love Barry Sachs. It was just that's just what I heard. I just, you know, um, it was just what I heard in my head. So I, I'm fortunate enough to be around people that can execute it, and you know, you got to be able to convey what you want and I'm around people that are geniuses and I know how to tell them what I was hearing and they knew how to do it. So, um, you know, just, that's all. It was just in my head. Very cool. I always think like I saw Santana in concert, I don't know, like five, six, seven years ago. And I had an opportunity. We sat really close, you know, like, I don't know, third row or something. And, uh, you know, if you ever seen Santana, he's got about 12 maybe 14 people up there and i i never it seems like a massive amount of work so that's what i saw in my head when i was listening to that i was like Good lord how the hell is she managing all those people thank you no yeah, it, was yeah. easy. it was easy because everybody was just feeling it title song snake farm mm -hmm. really like a swamp boogie heavy tremolo fun lyrics is there is that about anything or is that just another kind of fun thing you put together um, actually, that was the only song that I didn't write. It was uh, written by Ray Wiley Hubbard. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's actually older. I think the song's probably ten years old. Um, I was I have been recording in a studio in um, Wimberley, Texas, and Ray Wiley Hubbard had been recording in there as well. And the engineer was like, "Listen to this song," and he played that song, and I went bananas over it i loved it so much i i um somehow managed to get a copy of it and i put that in my cd player i put it on nonstop for two hours i could not stop listening to it i learned the lyrics i've been doing it ever since wow. i've done that song with ray before uh, we did a music video for it um it got pulled off the internet off youtube uh day before yesterday which was september 19th why is that uh, what do you mean you got pulled off? Well, I um, followed all proper protocol as far as licensing. I got my Harry Fox license, the video sync license. I got Judy's blessing. She's Ray's wife. Hmm. To video, I invited them to be in the video. I kept them in the loop the entire time. Um, and then um, I applied for the video sync license. Um, everything was – the ball was rolling, um, but – I never waited for the approval, I guess. Um, I kind of thought that my my label guys were, were keeping an eye on that. But, um, um, you know, it's all clearing up now. It's Good. all fine. So um, we, the, the guy who dropped the ball on the video sync license was the guy who was supposed to approve it. And he emailed me back. He said he was sorry. Everybody's everybody's cool oh, and uh, it's just a lesson you know we we have to make sure that everybody gets paid right right uh, and that's how you do it and I, I i definitely did everything correctly um 
we just, you know, dropped the ball on a certain thing and it was definitely unintentional and accidental. Yeah. So, but it was, it was heartbreaking to have my video taken down. Well, I'm glad it got resolved. <laughs> yeah. That is frustrating. Yeah, I it takes, YouTube jail. <laughs> it takes a lot of work to uh, get them up yeah. and do all that stuff. Hey, quick question for you in snake farm. And I, maybe Ray Wiley Hubbard wrote this. There's a mention of a, like a kind of a, not a punk band, but a band like a baby U2 called the alarm. Oh. And I was wondering, was that your reference or was that his original reference? No, that's his reference. The, those words are his genius. And um, like, why would anybody? What? How did he even know about the alarm? They, they had like oh, one hit single. I remember it, "Rain" because it was a good song. I have it, "Rain in the Summer." <laughs> um, it's all Ray on that. Um, Snake Farm is a real place uh, north of San Antonio. Uh, so, okay. oh, it's real. Yeah, yeah. You drive by. I think Ramona might be a real person as well. So, interesting. Very cool. Oh yeah, yeah. I should have said that in the beginning, and I didn't. No, all good. What's your fa- What's your favorite song on the album, if you have one, and why? I really like "Backroads, Freddie" because I like the groove. It's a driving song. Yes, it's about a creepy driver, and um, I really had a lot of fun with that riff. I have a lot of fun playing it live. It's my homage to ZZ Top, mm. um, but I also like. Um, all right by me, Mr. Fisher. I like that song. I like how it came together. I like the feel and um, the honesty in the in the playing. Cool. Now you're originally from Dallas, I think, right? I am. What kind of childhood did you have growing up? What was your childhood like? Well, it was very musical. Everybody was dabbling in some sort of instrument. Um, my older brother Robbie, he played bass and. He used to write for Bass Frontiers magazine, and he would do all these jazz transcriptions. But he's the one who taught me the major scale and the minor scale and the pentatonic scale. And then he's the one who turned me on to the real book book and showed me, oh, check this out. Look, people jam over this. And he showed me that. And um, my other brother, Scotty, he plays guitar. He's a, he was a virtuoso at the time. I mean, he was just very good. He was transcribing Paganini, Paganini solos. and. Wow. Um, you know, uh, Eddie Van Halen, Ingve to the Beatles. So I had, I got to hear him do that. Another brother plays drums. He just kind of dabbled in it. Uh, my sister played bass for a little while. Um, my mom was a p- true patron of the arts. She'd take us to the opera. She studied flamenco dancing. She clogged, um, you know, everybody was just very artistic and encouraged it. Um, so I'm very, very fortunate, um, growing up in a big, big musical artistic family. Yeah. That's very cool. What what kind of work did your dad do? Um, he was, uh, we had a, he had a couple of motorcycle dealerships and he kind of ran those. Um, and he was in sales, commission sales. He also sold cars and he was just that good. He could support five kids. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. He did. He did very very good. I mean, we weren't rich, for, you know, but if we were a four person family, we would have been. But, you know, there's five kids. There's seven of us. So, um, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were buying our own school clothes every year, but, um, you know, we worked for that money too. So that's fine with me. I'm glad that, um, we were instilled those values. So it was a good, 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 uh, family and nice. So you. Girl. You started playing guitar young, obviously had brother, siblings influence you. At what point in time did you say, man, I need to do this forever? You know, this is my thing. This is who I am. It was the 4th of July and I was 14. It was that summer. And I just wanted to play the Star Spangled Banner out my window like Jimi Hendrix. And I just worked on it that day. And I mean, I just... That I just knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, earlier, when I was, I remember when I was really young, um, I was watching Saturday Night Live, and I used to really enjoy the G.E. Smith band. Oh yeah, and, um, and I loved the bass player. I don't, I never knew his name, but he always reminded me of Stevie Ray Vaughan. I wanted to play with him, and I just loved it. And I just remember looking, watching, going, I, I want to do that. But I didn't pick it up seriously until I was fourteen. All right. Well, that's but that's a young age to to decide. Hey, this is you know I'm down on this. This is my thing. Yeah, I was totally down with it. Yeah, for sure. 
so what do you uh, now looking back right if you had to give advice to your younger self having paid the dues you've paid what advice might you have given yourself to do something different or avoid or do something on top of what you've already done well don't drink for one thing um number two is learn how to take a step back and look at the situation before reacting to it. Um, you know, um, I practiced a lot. I did everything I was supposed to do as far as, um, guitar. I mean, I learned jazz theory extensively. Um, I played in all kinds of bands. Um, I wouldn't really change anything else except for, you know, not, don't drink. not don't drinking and, and, uh, not to overreact to things. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's that's a difficult one if you're an emotional person. And I am. I'm very, very I'm passionate. It's, yeah, yeah. You call yeah. it emotional or whatever. It's yeah, passion. Yeah. Whether it's love or hate, it's still passion. Sure, passionate. absolutely. So, and I'm still that way to this day, to a fault. I recognize it every day. I'm like, well, it's the way I am. And I talk to people about it. They're like, well, you just have to learn how to accept this, this, and this. I'm like, I try. But <laughs> it's, it's hard. I can't. I feel so passionately about things that, you know, it's something that I'm learning to live with. No, I totally get it. Cause I, I have, that's something I, I work on all the time. Cause I'm pretty I'm both emotional or passionate, you know, not like nutty. I don't yeah. scream or anything like that, but I do tend to overreact. And I'm, as I'm getting older, you know, I'm just learning to like, you know, take a deep breath before engaging my brain on stuff and just, right. you know, but it's not easy. It's not easy, especially if you are filled with emotions. So, you know, how do yeah. you, how do you shut your emotions down? Well, you know, and it's a blessing and a curse in a way. Yeah. It feeds the art for sure. Mm -hmm. I will, I will say that it feeds the art and as it should, you know, any great musician I know, um, you know, everybody's got their quirks. Oh yeah, everybody in general, musician or not, yeah, yeah. Hey, and so in listening to your album, it it sounds like you're primarily a Strat player. Is that accurate? I've had the same Stratocaster since I was 14 years old, wow. and I've had the same 1967 Fender Super Reverb since I was 16 years old. So I play the same gear. Um, yes, and I have a Tele. I use the Tele on some of the stuff on the album. But um, my Strat is my number one. Was that a new Strat when you got it? Uh huh. It sure was. I I bought it. It was a nine. It's a ninety one, but I bought it in ninety two. Very cool. My buddy Jimmy Capolo sold it to me at Spear Music in Garland, Texas, and he was came down from New York. He's this New York Italian guy, and he's you know he's like oh, Jimmy Capolo. That's my name. I'm gonna be a luthier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he sold me this guitar. Immediately put big fat frets in it, and he sets up. He set up my guitar still to this day. He now builds Avila Capolo basses. Are you familiar with them? <laughs> no, I'm not. But that sounds oh, like a great story. See, they're boutique, and he's out. Of, you know, he's in Anaheim right now. Willie Weeks, Will Lee, Dave Pomeroy. The creme de la creme plays his basses that and guitars now. He basically makes exact replicas of the guitars and basses that you played as a child. Wow. And he is intense. So um, he still sets up my stuff. When he comes to Nashville, he'll do a thousand dollars worth of work in my living room. I love it. I love him. And, you know, we've been friends forever. And um, that's probably why I still play that same guitar. He just, he did it right. How the hell did you get your hands on a 67 Fender Super Reverb? It was, I was, you know, back when people still read the classifieds, it was in the Dallas Morning News in the classifieds. It was 67 Super Reverb for $500. Jimmy Capolo went with me and I was like, what do you think? He's like, yeah, it's a $500 tube amp. Yeah. And I bought it and, and I've still use it. That's awesome. What a, what a nice combo you got there. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, where am I going to go from there? <laughs> like yeah. The, yeah. It's the holy grail of amps. It is a blank canvas. You can do anything with it. It may be for some a little on the high end side. I could see that, but you know, you can make up for that with your palette, which is your pedal board. So 
How many uh, watts is that amp pushing? Forty. Yeah, that's it's a, loud though. Cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Believe me, that's forty watts is loud. I mean, I learned that. I, I'm not a professional, nor do I pretend to be one on TV or anywhere else. But you know, I play guitar and like I have a 38 watt Doctor Z, and it's too loud for my oh, yeah. know, house here. So yeah, 40 watts is plenty loud. Yeah, I played a uh, when I went last time I went to Norway. They got us a a 66 Super Reverb, and I could barely put that thing on too. I was wow. just cut people's heads off. It was so loud, but. You know, that's rock and roll. <laughs> Do you still practice? Yes, I have to. I, I, it's, I, I, you know, I got to learn a bunch of songs for people. So I'll work on that. Um, before my gig, I got to warm up because, um, I don't want to be warming up in front of people. <laughs> um, you know, people come out to hear you. So you don't want to, um, be blowing a bunch of shit everywhere. So mm. I, I try to, you know, get my thing down. Um, I don't try to play so much fast and flurry, uh, so much lately as I do try to do something tasteful. I'm trying to reconnect my ear. Um, it did get disconnected for these past, I don't know, eight years or so, but yeah, I practice. I like working on chordal structure of the harmonic minor. (laughs) It's one of my favorite things because it's so weird. It's so out there, but it's something that you can still use. Um, you know, I work on my slide playing a little bit. I try to just play in tune and in time. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll just pick an old, uh, my favorite West Montgomery song is four on six. Sometimes I'll try to warm up with that. I'll practice over James Brown, um, type stuff just to get, keep your chops up because you'll lose it if you don't, even if you're gigging all the time. No, you'll I, still lose it. I'm sure. Yeah. Do you have like a f- favorite album or like who are your, some of your influences guitar wise? Well, um, Wes Montgomery, Johnny Guitar Watson, Johnny Jerry- Guitar Watson. Oh yeah. God, yes, that man, yes, that man to everything. He's just my favorite all time, everything. And we share a birthday. I mean, if it wasn't for him, there'd be no Snoop Dogg. You know, it's like, <laughs> and he was also at the forefront of every decade of guitar, space guitar. Remember that song? You know, <laughs> all the way up to like his his funk stuff, and you know, I mean, he was just at the forefront of every genre. Etta James called him the greatest vocalist that ever lived, and um, he's just he's just up there for me. He's one of my favorites. Um, so Wes Montgomery, Jerry Reed, love him. Oh yeah. What a great Johnny music. guitar Watson, uh, Django Reinhardt, of course. Um, you know, I, I can't leave out Charlie Christian. So you really are steeped a lot in, in jazz for sure. I love it. It's my favorite. It's my favorite right now to listen to. I did rebel against it for a little while, but I always come back. Do you have like a favorite album, jazz or otherwise, just like in general? Well, I love the West Montgomery Silver Collection. It's mm-hmm. the Verve Collection, and it's got a live version of Impressions on there that is just, just well, a hell. You can you might have a wreck if you're listening in the car. I mean, it's, <laughs> I literally caught myself speeding listening to that. It's so intense. Um, love that album. Um, it's got to be one of my favorite albums of all time. If if you weren't playing music and doing what you're doing, what do you think you'd be doing instead? Uh, okay, I got two answers for that. One, I'd be a socialite, and <laughs> I would have married rich <laughs> and just hung out and got my nails done and <laughs> go have a fucking mimosa and <laughs> hair and oh, let's go work out and let's go shopping. I do that, but I can't. Uh, yeah, run with it. Um, go ahead. If, if, dream, if, if you're going to dream, dream big. Huh? Yeah, That's if right. I wasn't a musician, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to be a dancer, which probably has, probably just as bad as being a musician. A socialite or a dancer. Yes, first time that, uh, first response. It's <laughs> so <is> terrible <laughs> when you say those facts. Or anything, yeah. A socialite. No, it's all good. Shallow. I'd be as shallow as fuck. As shallow as I, I possibly be could be. Shallow <laughs> as fuck. I like that. I'd be. You, shallow that you can edit that out. Fuck. Shallow AF. Shallow as fuck. Okay. Uh, are you single? In a relationship? Uh, you know, I 
<laughs> was that a, that's a trick question, I guess. It's complicated. It's complicated. That? I like that category. It's not even complicated, really. <laughs> they used to have that. Is that isn't that a category they used to have on Facebook? It's complicated. Yep. Do they still have that? I don't know. I have no idea. I never checked that box. <laughs> All righty, well, that's that's a fair enough. We won't we won't go any more into that yeah. question. Um, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? Oh, I love ballet. I love um, kickboxing when I can do it. Um, I also love yoga. I like physical activity mm -hmm. um, because it's just another way of expressing myself. It's very therapeutic. Sure. You know, doing music as much as I do, um, it loses. Sometimes you can lose that feeling. <laughs> so um, I love ballet. I just love it. It's my favorite thing right now. I mean, we've never met, but I've seen photos of you. You seem like you're really fit. Is that natural or is that just through working out or both? Well, good genetics, yeah, but, you know, I'm 39, so things start falling. I and you, you gotta, you know, it's always, you got to work at it, always. Anybody with who's physically fit, they work at it. It's not natural, unless you're 19 years old. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's natural then, but you have to work at it. So, and, and plus being in this business, I got to keep up with them 19 year olds. Yeah, I hear that. Hey, you've been all over the world. You have a favorite place that you've been traveled? I love yeah. Norway. I love it. And I didn't play in Rome, but I love Rome. Oh, just amazing. Just great food, beautiful olive skin. Everybody's, I love you. You're just walking down the street. <laughs> I love you. And you're like, I love you too. Funny, I have a. I was at my wife's mom's house. My wife's from the UK, and, we, and I was only there once or twice. And I was at her mom's house, and she had this little picture one time of my wife as a little girl when she was. They went to Rome, I guess, and it's a little picture of Anne with, um, like, bending down, and there's all these birds around it. And so I keep that picture like near my desk. It's just a cool picture so anytime someone says italy or rome i always i always think of that so it, oh, i awesome. never never been there but it gives me good memories just because oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, everything you could be eating a donut and it's the best donut you've ever had in your life I mean, <laughs> oh it's just wonderful <laughs> food and, and people the atmosphere love it what's the favorite part of your job i love performing and i love I love seeing people forget about whatever their problems are and have them smiling and dancing and having a great time. I just love seeing people have a good time. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Is there a least favorite? Um, yeah, I don't like bad PAs. I don't like bad sound <laughs> people. Um, I don't like it when people walk out in the middle of the song or the middle of the solo, especially if they didn't pay anything to come in. Yeah. Um, no, but that makes total there's a lot sense. of perks. There's more perks to the job. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Is there anything you're currently working on that you're trying to improve, whether it's musically, personally, business, or anything else, but just something you're focusing a lot of attention on? Um, well, fixing up my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably, I, I would like to work on my slide technique again. I think it has wavered a little bit. When I first started playing... I literally picked up the slide and at a gig and was playing it ever since. And I didn't practice, but I had come from a jazz background and everything that was under my fingers, jazz wise went under my fingers, the slide. Mm -hmm. And I would go for all this weird stuff. So people were like, man, you're a great slide player. And I just like, was kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I was just doing it. And then when I started thinking about it, I, got worse at it. So I want to get uh, back okay. to that point where I was playing jazz on the slide. And there was, I didn't care about the rules. You know, one particular very, very, very famous slide player tried to give me a lesson and say, I, I shouldn't do this. And I was like, shrugged my shoulders and was like, okay. <laughs> and um, you should do your thing. As long as the note comes out with the right feel, and in time and in tune, you can, however, whatever it takes to get there, there's no rules. It's just guitar. Your, your played slide on the album it sounded great. Thank it's, you. It's my yeah. date on um, the album. Yeah. It's sound, I was recording those. It sounded, sounded real good. It, you know, Thank you. Real good. Uh, most embarrassing thing that's ever happened on stage or in the studio? 
<laughs> uh, when I was with the Red Elvises, um, <clears throat> we were in Bellingham, Washington, and I was the first. That was a three and a half month U.S. tour. The first month of the tour, I was a deer in headlights because there was lots of dancing, there was singing in Russian, and here I was, this little American girl in the back of a van full of Russians, and everybody's talking Russian all the time, and I thought I was prepared for the gig, but. You know, I just, ugh, it was so stressful. So the first three weeks we're going up and down the, we're doing like a, you know, California West Coast tour. We'll make it up to mm -hmm. Bellingham, Washington. And I, now I have to dress up. The, there was another girl in the band. She played accordion. She was phenomenal. Bring the house down on the keys. She was like Thelonious Monk meets, uh, she was just like monk in a Russian rockabilly band and she was <laughs> gorgeous. She would wear stiletto heels and these sequin dresses and she was just gorgeous, redhead, feisty and played her freaking butt off. Well, we get to Bellingham, Washington and I'm trying to keep up with her. So I'm wearing cute dresses and, you know, trying to move all sexy and stuff. And, um, our show was amazing. We had, uh, um, belly dancers. Well, we kind of showed up late to this gig in Bellingham and, um, you know, I grabbed my dress and I put it on and it's like a black dress with a big split down the middle. And I got like these granny panties on and they're white. Okay. The dress is black. <laughs> and I have like these, these, these pantyhose and like garter belts and, and um, when we get to the stage, there's like the stage that looks out to the audience. And behind the stage, there's a loft. And um, so me and the other singer, Igor, Igor Yuzov, he, we do this like synchronized swimming dance thing where we lay on the floor and you stick your legs up and then you like – do these little scissor things and well I lay down and we lay down and we stick our legs up and all of a sudden my panties are showing and there's a crowd of people Holy behind God. the loft and the drummer is losing it. He's laughing so hard. The place is just fucking behind me going crazy and I'm just like, oops. So I immediately put my hands and cover my granny panties and well, thank God they were there in the first place. Um, but, yeah. um, and also, this was before everybody could take pictures with the cell phone. So, oh there, yeah, yeah. I don't think there are, but um, it was a very, very funny moment. Everyone remembers it. Everyone reminds me about it. Um, so I might as well tell it and let everyone know that I'm laughing too. That was you. That was you. <laughs> that was me. It was me. Hey, I got two more questions for you. What's the sure. most important lesson? that your business has taught you? Um, that you don't need a label. You don't need any of those people. You just need a little bit of money. Um, and you don't even need a lot of money. Um, you can get your own UPC, UPC codes. You can get your own ISRC codes. You can enter it into SoundScan yourself. You can get your own video sync license. You can do your own you can do it all yourself, but you just have to learn. There's a lot to learn. Um, don't ever, ever throw your song out there in this day and age on the internet without doing any of those things. You embed every little code you possibly can in your song before you send it out there. Otherwise you will never get paid and somebody else will. Good somebody else will live off that black box fund all the money where people have not matched the copyright owner to the song is all that money is sitting in an account. Somebody is living off the interest and it is not you. And it is full of unknown artists money and you'll never see it. It could be $30, but it could be $30 times a million unknown artists. So it just, that's what, that is what I'm passionate about right now. It really bothers me. And, um, you know, the music business isn't the same anymore. Um, it's changed. It used to be, uh, you know, Hugo Peretti, um, who wrote, I can't help falling in love with you. And George Weiss, those guys, you know, they would go write these songs and they had all their bases covered. 
and they got their due. Nowadays, people don't go through the licensing and the copyright and throw it out there, and it's to everyone's disadvantage. That's what I learned. No, that's cool. And I, 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 commend, I commend you for doing all that work on your own and figuring it out. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be blogging about it. I'm going to, I'm going to share all of that information freely. Anything I've learned because I, the power is in the artist's hand. It is not the label. They need you and they will always need you. They have money. That's it. And they are not cool. They have to buy, they have to buy you. They need to buy their cool. They got to buy their scene. So always remember that you have the power, even if you're broke, you, the artist has the power. So we have the power to heal. You know, we have the power to make people forget their problems. And a song is forever. People, they embed a memory with that. And you can awaken feelings that with music that you really can't do with anything else except for art, any type of art. But, um, you know, it's a powerful thing. That's why it tries to get suppressed. I hear that. One last question. It's a very tough sure. question. It's the toughest question I ask, I think, anyway. What's your definition of happiness? Beth Garner. Uh, my definition of happiness is... Um, <laughs> ooh, I should have read that question and been prepared for this one. Um, <laughs> That's a tough question, even if you read it. It's a very tough question. Um, my definition of happiness is um, being consumed by art and so much that you really don't care what anybody thinks or what anybody says and if you know if there's food on the table or if the lights are on so just being so immersed into your art and then making other people happy from that making other people happy there that's the definition of happiness very cool and let me ask you a question about that just to challenge you a little bit sure how long can you make, can someone you think maintain that definition if, if they're not getting some sort of reward, whether it's financial or some rec, you know, an attaboy, you know? Well, you know, that's funny that you say that because music, you can do it your whole life and not see that any progress, you know, you go paint your house, you see a finished product. Um, music, you can be working on something forever and ever and ever and ever and never, ever see, um, improvement or a finished product. Um, so how long can someone maintain that style of happiness? You know, that's a good question. It'll yeah. probably end up, you know, um, as long as they're their necessary resources are there. They got food, air, water, shelter, then hopefully forever. Right. Well, I mean like, cause I, I mean like I love playing. Am, am I any good? I don't know, but I and I play every day and I really enjoy it and it gives me tremendous satisfaction and, and it, and it's like, you know, the gift I give myself every day, but yeah. I have other ways of surviving. And if I, I wondered, you know, I was just thinking when you said like, man, would I feel that good about what I'm doing? But I'm not putting myself out there either. So you know, it's it's a, you know, it's a whole other issue. But um, but anyway, I appreciate you being so open with your uh, answer. No problem. No hey, problem. I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, I know I'd like to just direct everybody to your stuff. Is that okay if I do that? Of course, please. All right. So check out Beth Garner. She's a really cool person and she's an excellent guitar player and a very good entertainer. You could check her out online on her website at bethgarner.com. That's Beth B E T H G A R N E R.com. Her new album is really cool. It's called snake farm and you can get that on her website as well. Bethgarner.com and you can get it on iTunes or amazon.com. And are you going to be touring anytime soon? Um, well, I might have, mainly I just play around Nashville, but I play four times a week. A lot of people come travel to see us and see my band. I will be, um, in January, I might be in Chicago, um, hopefully opening for Buddy Guy, hopefully. Holy shit. I'd, uh, I'd almost fly up to see that. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's going to be a big old deal if I get that gig. Um, 
you know, um, I also play guitar for different people, um, playing guitar with a guy named Cody Purvis next weekend. But I know this, well, I'll already have been out with him when this interview airs. Um, you just basically have to follow me on Facebook, which is Beth Garner music and Beth Garner music on Instagram and Beth Garner music on Twitter. Um, if you follow those, you'll see, you know, pictures of my intimate life and you know, <laughs> I always post my gigs. Usually I post my gig the day of, but I also answer my emails. If you come to town and you want to see me, I will let you know where I'm playing. And, um, you know, I try to, because I'm not necessarily getting inundated with fan mail, I answer all of it. Um, <laughs> So, and she's um, got the yeah. red. We'll give you a, a special code to see the red Elvis photo, if you. Uh, enter the- <laughs> oh God! I wonder. I, you know what? It might. Sh- it might turn up someday, and then I'll, I'll. I will own it. It's all right. Worst I'll things could. Worst things could happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Agreed. There's hey. probably. Uh, there's probably more worse things that have happened, but. I don't even remember. <laughs> hey, listen, I really appreciate your time. I really hope you do get to Thank open you. up for Buddy Guy and, and you and I will stay in touch. And uh, I look forward Definitely. to seeing uh, really cool things and have you back on the show in a couple of years. And when your next album comes out, we could talk about that. Thank you so much, Craig. I appreciate you finding me and asking me to do this. And I'm absolutely honored. Thank you. I, I really appreciate your time. And it, it's yeah. uh, you're a very genuine person. And I like Thank talking you. to you. So, right. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. I want to say thanks again to Beth Garner for spending time with us. Check out her stuff. Go to BethGarner.com. Get her new CD called Snake Farm on iTunes, on BethGarner.com, iTunes, or Amazon.com. And go to everybody. Well, I don't even know my own site. Go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com <laughs> and sign up to get notified about future podcast episodes, along with some other cool new stuff we'll be doing for guitar players. Now, be nice. Go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, I'm out. Peace, y'all. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.